Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, lecture is going to be about cement molds. Now, as I've said earlier in my series, I'm going to try and put out instruction and lectures on things that you can use for molding that you, you know, you can get your hands on easy. This one is a very, very old, old, uh, you know, method of molding and uh, it uses three main ingredients sand cement and water that's it and some the cement the sand you can get uh play sand from home depot it's a very fine sand very good for whatever molding you're going to try and, and do the surface i mean the cement is just your ordinary Portland cement, also av available at Home Depot or any of the other big stores. And then water, available at the tap. Got this. This is the, uh, the paragraph out of Molding Methods and Materials put out by the American Foundryman Society. Try to get this back up there. I don't know if you can read it at all, but there, are, you know, the advantage of, mold, of of cement molds is that the molds may be air dried. You don't need any costly drying equipment, and the molding bonds can develop very high dry strength. Now, the disadvantage is is the possibility of molds freezing in winter because of the you know water being in it. Molding, materi molding materials usually more costly uh, but not nowadays because the sand and the Portland cement is pretty pretty uh, you know cheap difficult shakeout well that goes without saying once this stuff solidifies it's like a block of cement so you're gonna have a heck of a time trying to uh, break it out the rapid use of materials you need to use it right away to prevent setting. It's like trying to build something you've already uh, cast, or rather you've already mixed your cement, and you try and use it when it's setting up. You gotta make this sand, use this sand fast. It, uh, there's no flexibility in this stuff. Once it sets, sets up, it's hard as a rock. Usually the set molds, cement molds, or molding materials cannot be reused. Now, nowadays, if you have a, a sand reclamation setup, you could probably reuse it. They don't forget this is mainly silica sand. There's silica sand, a little bit of water, and some of the uh, cement, Portland cement. So, if you've got a way of breaking stuff up into its smallest, you can probably wash this sand back down again get rid of all the uh, powdered up cement um, Portland cement and maybe use it again but uh, if you're like me I don't have anything to crush uh, these molds and use them again you're likely to just be you know throwing them away throwing them away once you've made use of them get this out of the way now the formula or recipe for cement uh, molds or cement molding sand very very simple as I said only three ingredients sand cement and water Now the formula in the book, all it does, all it tells you, is that the cement has got to be 10%, and the water is going to be between 4 and 5%. I just upped it to 5% for simplicity's sake, which leaves the rest of that for 85% sand. Okay. But now here, here was my problem. I have a mixer 
that will not allow for 100 pounds of sand to be put into it. If you put 100 pounds of sand into it, it's almost a solid block. There's no movement. So therefore, you wouldn't have any effective mixing capability in there. So we have to do it at, at a 150 pound bag. Well, how do I figure out a 50 pound bag is going to be my 80 85 percent of sand how do I figure the rest of it I mean I've got to find out what the total amount is so that I know the cement to put 10 percent of that total amount and five percent of the total amount water okay so here's where your your uh, you know math is going to come into play now I can tell you I can count on my hands and toes the amount of times that in 20 years of being a molder in the Navy I ever used a mat. Basically what we did is we made the molds, we filled the crucible up to 80%, 80% being the safety factor, and then we poured it, poured all the molds, and uh, poured the, the remainder into ingot molds. And that was it. We didn't have to worry about math so much. But now math comes in handy. All right. Now algebra. Anybody who's learned any algebra, when you're trying to find something, you start off with your unknown. X. X the unknown. Well, X the unknown in this case is the total amount of weight of which I'm going to compute 10% and 5% of what I need to add. Okay. So X, the total amount of weight. That's later. I can't do it equals yet. Okay, now we know that 85% of X, of the total, is going to equal 50. So, 85% in decimal terms is 85, 0.85. And that'll equal. 50. Well, in algebra, you want to have everything over on the one side and have the x remain by itself. So, if we have 0.85 divided by 0.85, that'll make 1, x times 1. You don't need the 1. But what you do here, you've got to do here. 50 divided by 0.85. All right? So, now you have x equals 50 divided by 0.85, which equals 59 pounds. All right, now we know the, ma the, the uh, mass, the end, x equals 59 pounds. The whole rigmarole is going to weigh 59 pounds. A quick thing, cement, we need to put in, well first sand we're going to have 50 pounds. Okay, cement, which is 10 percent, which is going to be equaling The, the X, which is 5.9 pounds, rounding it up to 6 pounds. Okay, water, 5% of the, and now remember, these percentiles are percentage by weight, okay? If you had a 100 pound sack of sand, the whole mixture would have 85 pounds of sand, 10 pounds of cement, 5 pounds of water. In this case, it's going to be 50 pounds of sand, 6 pounds of cement, water, which is going to be 5% of the weight. That comes out mathematically to 2.95. We'll round that up to three pounds okay so we got 50 pounds 56 57 58 59 pounds 
everything comes out mathematically correct okay so that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be putting 50 pound bag a 50 pound bag in this mixer we're going to put in six pounds of portland cement in there mix it dry for about five minutes i think the book says three minutes but i'm you know this is very fine sand so i'm going to going to uh, give it five minutes and then once that is completely uh, mixed together we're going to be putting the water in there now before i do any of that this sand that came from home depot in a plastic bag was already wet so what i've got to do is I've got to dry that stuff out as dry as I can possibly have it. So, before I go any further, I'm going to get off the, uh, the camera and start drying that out. And once that dries, it's dry enough to where I, I know, I'm pretty sure it's very, very low on water, I'll bring you guys back. Now, while I was out here, I had neglected to explain to you why the cement uh, molds would be you know a limited type of mold limited in that you could ram up and uh, pour your basic shapes okay if you were uh, for instance ramming up this which is my pattern for an ingot mold if you ram that up that's going to work because the metal when you pour it in here when it fills up this cavity and it solidifies this metal is going to shrink this way the metal is going to shrink this way this way and this way dimensionally not to mention you know lengthways it'll be uh, you know every dimension you can see here that this is going to turn into metal it shrinks away from this okay if you for instance wanted to ram up a sphere same thing is going to happen this whole this whole uh, unit is going to shrink in towards its center away from the cement mold now some let's say you you need to make a spacer for a piping system two flanges and a connecting pipe and uh, you would have a hole in there being formed by a core okay this is a cutaway view of what it might look like minus the gating systems and the sprue and the pouring basin now let's say that you filled all this metal up right you filled all that up that's a, that's a core print that's a core print so the only thing that's going to be metal here is this flange this flange and this piece of pipe connected by the two flanges all right well this dimension will be shrinking this way and will be shrinking this way for this for this shape Okay, both sides, those shapes will be shrinking this way, inwardly into the center of this shape. Same here. This shape is going to be shrinking in that way, that dimension towards the center line, away from the cement mold. But here's, here's where the problem is. If those were the only dimensions being uh, that were being poured and were shrinking, that'd be fine. Except the problem is, this face 
in here and here is going to be restrained by this big old chunk of cement right in between. Everything is shrinking. What also needs to shrink is this face needs to go this way, right? For this whole thing to shrink to the size and be solidified and be a nice casting, all of those dimensions need to do the shrinkage without any anything stopping it. Well, you've got a big old piece of sand here, so solid as a rock piece of sand that ain't going to move for you. It ain't going to collapse. It's going to stay that way. So any mold that you make out of this cement uh, molding process, you've got to make it to where there isn't going to be any pinching of any portion of your casting by the uh, by that. You know, the uh, it's got to have the collapsibility all over for something as sophisticated as that. Okay? Um, if you were to, you know, I, my, my, my prediction would have been is if you made one of these out of cement, okay, and, you know, maybe there's not even very much shrinkage at all, but you're going to find that because this section in here didn't collapse when this, these flanges were trying to go this way and this way, right along this flange's border where the flange meet the pipe, solid pipe section, you're going to have a tear. Right, and base not though this far out, but right where this edge meets this edge, right where it should have shrunk and nice and solid, because this was kept, this was being kept from going this way by this sand. That's going to start solidifying with a tear built in, because the 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 this portion here is not going to be stopped by shrinking. This portion is, so it's going to tear away from it. It might be as big as an 8 inch, 16 inch tear. It might only be halfway around. It might be all the way around, and it would totally ruin everything that you tried to accomplish. So when you're going to be using this type of um, molding material, just make absolutely certain that none of that cement mold is going to prevent proper shrinkage of your entire casting uh, for your casting to come out just right. I have never used this myself. You know, this is going to be a ex big experiment for me. When I make the, uh, the ingot mold out of this stuff, first I'm going to pour some ingots. It's all going to be out of aluminum. Now I'm going to see what kind of wearing takes place? Does, you know, is, is this uh, the stuff going to be so solid that the that the shrink, you know, the material, the metal will be shrinking away from the the molding material in such a way as that it won't rub against the surface of the uh, mold cavity and therefore, you know, not ruin it at all, or is the metal going to be slick or or uh, fluid enough? To be able to get into whatever gaps there they are between sand grains, and you know, tear up the surface of the inside of the mold cavity, like you know, when the uh, the icebergs receded back up to the North Pole and tore up the land. We have no, I have no idea yet of what it's going to be like, but you and I shall find out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've got dry sand finally. Had to have this rolling for a couple of days with the, a fan blowing inside this, this changing its position ever so often, exposing new sand, uh, a dehumidifier in the room. I must have emptied that thing three times in a two day period. And now, according to my touch, we've got dry sand, 50 pounds of dry sand. Now, I gotta get 
Portland cement. Hope you can see that. The Portland cement. Let me see if you can see that. Yep, you can see that. All right. Get my scoop. Wherever she is. I had her just here. And there she is on the bench. All right. Got a nice little beam scale here. Got my bucket. Not changing the bucket. So this is going to stay the same. You got to got to weigh your bucket on the beam scale. And it's a good idea to mark it. Like for instance, this plastic bucket is two and a half pounds. Okay. So if I've got to get six pounds, six pounds of cement, I have to add two and a half to the six, which will be eight and a half. Okay. Now. Once that thing goes up to, up to midway, I'll have six pounds in there. Now if you can see the dust going up in the air, then you can realize why we're going to have to have this. The mixer covered. when we mix it. But there's a lot of dust going in the air and you really shouldn't be breathing this stuff in especially the young guys and gals because that means that you will have a lot more time on your hands to be able to get sick. I'm not so worried about me so much anymore I'm 63, and if I never had cancer of the lungs or or any of that by now, we can guess that it'll take me quite some time to uh, develop it after this point. It's starting to go. Pardon my hind end. Point, point at you. And that's it. Okay. All right. 50 pounds of this. Six pounds of this. this is fully mixed it'll be three pounds of water now I'm gonna have to get my little hammer get it on there so that I can have a good seal because one thing one thing I don't want is to have this room covered in cement. Anybody who's ever worked with that before, uh, they know how bad that is. Cement gets wet, it gets sticky. If it dries out, it gets hard. It's almost like uh, not cleaning out your muller after you've made some CO2 sand with the sodium silicate in there. The sodium silicate sticks to everything. All the moving parts, everything. You don't clean it out immediately after you've mixed your sand. Everything's going to be frozen like you just filled that thing up with super glue. Okay, now I'm going to run this thing for five minutes. And in the meantime, I'm going to weigh out the water. But this thing makes so much noise, I'm going to have to. Uh, Turn the camera off so you guys don't get killed in your sound system. 
Okay, it's been five minutes. I took the lid off, I looked inside, and everything's a nice gray color. There wasn't any, any dust rising up to meet me. Let's see if I can get you looking in there. There's the inside right there. I'm fairly certain that almost all the grains of sand has been coated by the Portland cement, mainly because if I get this junk out of the way, I can point you towards the molding bench and you can see this it was the original color of the sand all right so that dried out over a couple of days five minutes later every grain of sand I'm presuming every grain of sand has been coated by the uh, Portland cement and now it's time to add the water. Okay, let me get this back where I won't hit it with anything. I've already weighed out the water while this, this was mixing. in the middle and let it soak in a little bit so that the water doesn't get to the side of the mixer and uh, just coat the mixer with stuff that I'm going to have to scrape out later. Okay. Now this, we know, doesn't have really a time that you mull it. Because what you want is you want a uniform mixture. And only you are going to be able to be the one to determine whether or not this moisture has been spread throughout. So I'm going to let it go. It's about half soaked in by now. And while I'm mixing it, I'll be probably, un, you know, taking some of the stuff off the back. And, uh, you know, the inside, uh, inside shell, mixing it all, anything that sticks, I'll have to force it loose but when you come back I'll be ready to ram up my little uh, ingot mold okay didn't have to do hardly much of anything that water unlike uh, like refractory cement it spread evenly within a matter of like maybe two minutes okay Here's my little setup, my little ingot mold, ingot pattern I mean, this will be the ingot mold. Give me a little bit of tartine in there, don't want to have to fight with it. I also don't want to have a bunch of lumps in here to mess up my, my surface, my face. It does feel pretty dense. 
what this is, as with any mold that you make, you've got to, you've got to cover the entire pattern and the parting line with this sand. This sand is known as facing sand. It covers the face of the pattern I mean, in addition to the uh, parting board, or rather the uh, ram up board. That's what this is in this case. Now, you're not quite covered up. It acts very nice. It's not super heavy, and it acts nice and smooth. Well, it is very um, fine sand. Now, one thing I don't see hardly anybody ever doing, and this is an important part of your making a mold, you put the facing sand, the smoothest, finest sand on it, on your, on your pattern, and after that, you don't just start ramming, you don't just put stuff in here and start ramming it up, you gotta tuck it, okay? This, your little fingers, are acting as the little hand rammers right now. You're tucking it in there, and with yourself, your control that you can exhibit using your fingers, you're less likely to hurt your pattern and more likely to push your sand in every nook and cranny, all of the details that you're trying to replicate. Okay, all of that stuff is covered. Now I can do a little bit of pressure. Your first time around the pad, the perimeter of the pattern, make sure you do it easy. Because if it's a loose pattern like this one, you might shove it off center away from where you want to go. And uh, you'll regret it later on, especially if it was important that you put it there. Now we start filling this thing up as best we can, as quick as we can. Like I said, I don't know uh, exactly how fast this stuff is supposed to be. Uh, cure. So I'm going to go. I'm going to make the assumption that this is CO2 sand because that stuff does solidify quickly. That does cure quickly. And once it is cured, you can't mess with it anymore. So, whatever your plans were at the time. Uh, going to get it done as quickly as possible. Do this by layers. Don't try and get it all in at one time. And never, never use the butt end of the hand rammer or the rammer until you've got your sand all the way up to the surface. Then you can do that. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make this sand, this layer of sand that you're ramming in here, consistently hard throughout. If you were to go ahead and ram a layer and then, then ram it and then flatten it out, then you have a segregate, you know, something that's different from the rest. And it's, it's very important that it's consistent strength throughout the entire cope, throughout the entire drag, or any of the cheeks that you're ramming up. Otherwise, you pick it up, and if that particular layer is, is a, a weak layer, whoop, out it falls. And then you've got to do everything all over again. I don't know how long this is going to last. I'm hoping that this is going to be a good surrogate to a cast iron ingot mold, but we will see. You know, cast iron ingot molds also wear, you know, develop wear and tear. 
and uh, you know those are much stronger than sand. I was a little worried that a 50 pound bag or a 50 pound batch wasn't going to be enough to fill this up. Thankfully it looks like I got plenty. Not bunches extra but plenty to fill this batch up up here. Here we are at the very top. Now I can use the butt end of this hand rammer. After I Tighten this up between layers. This will be kind of neat if this works as good as the American Foundry Society or Foundryman Society says it will. I gotta get my strike. Let's see if this is big enough. Looks like it. One of the best strikes that you can possibly use is a piece of angle iron and you lay it these flats or rather these edges flat down. As you can see just like a, some kind of a big engine or a earth moving machine like a grater it will smooth out most everything hit it at an angle like a guillotine boom you've got it okay now another thing I don't know about this is I don't know if this material puts out a lot of gas. Okay. So what I'm going to do, like I do with every mold, is I'm going to vent it. Okay. If I can find a nice long screwdriver that I don't care about anymore, And it goes almost all the way down to the bottom. What I do know that's in this this sand is water. And when you pour whatever material you're, uh, you're going to be pouring into your mold, you have to give if you're using the same material, you're going to have to give the water a way to get out. Otherwise, you're going to have possible steam explosions inside your, your, your sand or you might have a steam explosion right at the face of your of your uh, mold cavity and mold and uh, all you'll have is our uh, defects. I'm going to get a better screwdriver in the near future. Okay, now we got to turn this thing over so that I can pull the pattern out.
me see if I've got you at a good angle. I'm going to be going over there next. Now, one of the things you learn <coughs> when you're a molder in the Navy, and possibly a molder in the outside too, because I've never worked out in the foundries on the outside, is you've got to be able to turn these. Okay, now uh, we had to have a little gap there because our battery ran out. I'm going to have to get used to how long I can speak without losing batteries. Anyway, as I was about to say, one of the first things you learn in the, the foundry trade in the, in, the, in the Navy is that you can't just pick up your molds and turn them over without having the bottom boards on them. Why would that be? Well, because you'd remove the bottom board, you remove the support for the mold. And it could very well mean that you're going to allow your uh, pattern to fall out. And if your pattern falls out, or any of the any of the things that you rammed up in there fall out, you got to start all over again. We don't like to do that. So, what we need to do is we need to roll this over. Just like that. Alright. And she did nothing, nothing fell out. That's nice. Okay. One moment, I'll move you closer. trying to do when you wrap your mold is you're trying to put enough gap around the mold that you can withdraw the pattern without causing any damage to the mold cavity. So the first thing you do is you take any of the sand that has squeezed around past this surface and you get out of get it out of there. Well, let's see. Doing me no good. Alright. One moment I will get something that can actually work. Alright. Anything that's got a gap in it so that you can hit it hit the draw spike or the nail or whatever you're using to get it out anything that's got a gap that'll work with something like this you need to go all the way around exert force all directions so that nothing can be a pain And the last thing you do is you reseat your nail, your draw spike, and there we go. We pulled it out. Came out nicely. Didn't pull, although apparently I did. It looks like that material got a little bit past the uh, parting powder that I did put in there. So that means that it's likely that later on I'm going to have to, if I ever do this again, I'm going to have to do a better job at coating this. But it still didn't mess up. Okay. Now, the only thing that's left to do is let this thing seat, or let it cure. It is cement. So uh, once it cures, it hardens. And I'm, and I'm relatively certain that the uh, process has concluded. I'll bring you back and we'll see exactly how good or bad this is. 
it's got real good you know it does deep it does cover detail real good because there was a uh, a bit of a crack in my pattern from where I joined the uh, the wood together on one of these ends oh yeah right in here if you can I can't tell if you can see it or not I'll try and give you a little glimmer anyway and it replicated that crack right there or that indentation uh, so the stuff acts really good when it comes to detail but we will see how good it is when it comes to hard it's supposed to be very good when it comes to uh, dry hardness all right so now comes the time I got to hurry up and get my mixer out on the driveway and clean it out before any of that stuff hardens good morning everybody this is now oh the next morning of my working on this testing this this material um, last night ever so often every hour or so I kept testing this and probably from the time that I tested it the first time which was about an hour after I had made this to probably four hours after I made this it seemed like the it, it had developed a thick skin but it still felt a little bit flexible when I gave it some you know light uh, touch but uh, last night about 11 ish I came out to test it again and it had lightened up the color had lightened up considerably starting on the outside working its way in and it was rock hard where it had turned light okay now this morning I came out to check on it every part that I've touched is as hard as a regular piece of concrete and I checked you know it's it's hard so it looks like it'll be a nice a nice little mold for pouring uh, ingots but I did check you rub on it you rub it on enough and you will get some grains so it's not invulnerable okay uh, so I expect that once we pour molten metal in there and it solidifies when it starts shrinking in on itself as it pull as it pulls uh, towards the center there will be a little bit of <clears throat> excuse me a little bit of um, you know rubbing a little bit of wearing uh, don't know <clears throat> how long this is going to last in this basic form I mean it, you would consider it would uh, slowly but surely become less and less less and less defined less and less distinct a shape like this but I'm not going to use it for 500 uh, ingots I'm going to use it I'm probably going to use it just to melt down all the uh, aluminum I have now which is almost a, a 55 gallon drums worth of crushed aluminum cans and then once that's done depending on its condition and its state uh, I may or may not keep this any longer uh, these are these sides are just screwed in not glued so I can take it all apart and then toss this in the recycling bin once it gets done but the one thing I did want to show you also is that there was no difference there was no shrinkage there was no expansion from the uh, from the when this was curing so if you're going to use this material which I you know I I, I recommend it really it, it seems like a very good material uh, under certain conditions because it really did do a good job on uh, maintaining the sharpness of the edges and uh, replicating the details of this crude uh, pattern so I mean there's there's things you can do for instance if you got a couple of pieces of metal and cast 
a pattern in there and you had hole a you know a sprue hole up here and you and you dug a little uh you know well it would still be a sprue in there and just poured it straight here and had two you know these be a two piece mold pouring through the side hey you know depending on what you're trying to make it might work just great but you're not going to use this for a regular like green sand core because you're you know it's not going to uh, allow for the collapsibility around certain portions of a more sophisticated pattern but it is hard and uh, it looks like it's going to be just fine for a ingot mold and for that that'll be the end of this I was going to uh, extend this this uh, recording a little bit more uh, because in the near future I am going to pour some of the you know pour that aluminum I gotta I gotta uh, cast you know in preparation for a few future aluminum projects but this is already I think almost 45 minutes or maybe a little bit more so I'm going to just get this put this in the can as, as they called it and uh, make it available on the week that it's going to come out and for those of you who have sat through the first two lectures or videos uh, thank you <laughs> and I know they're probably not all that instructional uh, they you know the uh, fictional account of the uh, person in the in the dim past finding and, and working with the copper you know they don't really have a story written down in cuneiform about this guy doing all this so we really don't have any absolute proof of a person doing this but it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure out that somebody had to have done it in order you know we, we know that our ancestors are just as clever as we are today if not more given what they had to work with back then so we can make some good assumptions good presumptions on how certain things went back then and uh, it's you know it helped kind of fill in some some gaps in knowledge for those who uh, never really had an idea to think about uh, what might have happened 10,000 years ago uh, just after we had, had started making our way out of you know we're, we're really getting established out of uh, the motherland in Africa okay so back to this this came out good this, this looks like a serviceable mold and I highly recommend under certain uses this um, cement mold technique we'll see you next time oh and uh, for those of you who you were molders in the Navy Liberty Golf <laughs>